Welcome back to The Jesus Trip. I'm John Crowder, and this is episode 9 of 10 in our Consuming Fire series. We've looked at scripture, church history, and so much on the topic of ultimate restoration, the restoration of all things. And we're going to tie a ribbon on a lot of the themes that we've been discussing so far in this series. So this episode may be a good key for interpreting the whole. Our discussion on the nature of hell the refining fire, I'd again highly recommend you watch these videos in order. Maybe re-watch some of them in light of what we even cover here today. The concept of what we call the sinful nature. In Greek, it's simply sarx or flesh. Understanding this gives us a Pauline lens to overlay so much of what's going on in the New Testament, including the fearful judgment parables of Jesus and the apocalyptic scenes in the book of Revelation. In fact, our very understanding of hell. I've spent easily 16 years poring over this very topic in detail. For starters, let me say that when Sark's flesh is used in scripture, this is not a vilification of your physical body. Okay, that's a heresy called Gnosticism. Jesus has a body, resurrected, glorified, now outside the confines of space and physics and time, but a body nonetheless. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Your members are members of righteousness. Your physical meat sack is not evil. Now, it counts for nothing, but your resurrected body, well, we shall all be changed, and what we shall become we do not know, but your humanity itself is holy. And this is affirmed in the very incarnation of Jesus Christ. The very humanity of God in Jesus Christ affirms his endorsement, even identification with your humanity. But when Sark's flesh is used in a sort of a sense of the sinful nature in a negative sense, well, if you've even skimmed the Pauline epistles, you'll see that in every one of his letters, he says that our old self, our old sinful nature, well, it has died with Christ. Romans 6, Galatians 2, Colossians 3, 2 Corinthians 5, it's everywhere. One of the chief lies of religion is that we are still battling a sinful nature. Look, Jesus is our sanctification, 1 Corinthians 1.30. We were co-crucified with him, Galatians 2.20. For we are convinced that if one died for all, all have died. And this is core to what I have preached for ages. So I'm not here to deal with ridiculous objections that we still have this dual nature, which we have to kill off to become holy, to essentially save or sanctify ourselves. That is non-Christological tripe. Now, obviously, we're still growing. We're waking to and learning to walk in the truth of this reality. But God does not demand perfection. Jesus Christ is our perfection. Nevertheless, I understand many of the objections that people have to this. Um, but these come from fundamental misunderstandings about what the sinful nature is how we shed it, and why there seem to be these scriptural admonitions, rebukes to sinning Christians if they are supposedly holy, or moreover, why can Christians sin anyway if they are separated from a sinful nature? Now, this is obviously beyond the scope of one short YouTube video. I would encourage you to dig through my archive of material Grab my book, Mystical Union, that I wrote on this subject over 15 years ago. But if we could just define the sinful nature, a word that is not technically even in Scripture. Again, it's implied by Sark's. Uh, it is the propensity toward evil, toward self-gratification, perhaps the lust of the flesh, if you will, the compulsion to live for our base physical desires. Um, so, so we could posit this really as an identity crisis. 
It is the Adamic delusion. The sinful nature is a lie existence. It is the false self. We must define this not as a boogeyman that we have to fight off, kill off, but as a delusion we awake from. Not an ontological evil that God created. God doesn't create evil. Uh, he would be synonymous with evil in that case, which is why Calvinists, in their flattened understanding of sovereignty, well, they, they just blame God for all evil. But this denies the terrestrial, earthly, and the cosmic rebellion in the heavens that took place in the fall. See, <clears throat> by endowing humanity with the ability to create as recipients of the divine image, as church father Maximus the Confessor says, this false existence, an attempt to exist apart from God, to devolve into non-being, well, this was, in a sense, our own false incarnation. And we're going to cover this a little later in our final episode. But our own attempt to exist apart from Mr. Existence himself, that's what we're dealing with, which is lunacy. Okay, nothing exists outside of him. So the false self, it has no basis in reality. It's not even part of creation. It's not part of being. If anything, it's anti-being, it's anti-existence, it's anti-ontological. It's a lie. Now look, a lie is a thing, technically, it's in the dictionary as a noun, a lie is a something, but in reality, a lie is a nothing, it's an untruth. Uh, just as darkness is merely the absence of light. Well, so many church fathers had this view of evil, both in the East, going back to Augustine in the West, Okay, a non-thing, an anti-thing. And this is the composition of what the sinful nature is. It's a false self, a denial of reality. And therefore, it is something that the gospel passionately wakes us up from, rouses us from the delusion. We are by no means totally corrupt, as some posit. We have original innocence. We are made in God's image. But this false self in a sense, is something we concoct. And I think that the man who articulates this most profoundly in modern times is the great contemplative monastic writer Thomas Merton. And I have a long, extensive, but very rich quote of his that I would like to read for you. Okay, here it goes. <clears throat> Merton says, Every one of us is shadowed by an illusory person, a false self. This is the person that I want myself to be, but who cannot exist because God, because truth, light, knows nothing about him. And to be unknown to God is altogether too much privacy. My false and private self is the one who wants to exist outside the reach of God's will and God's love, outside of reality and outside of life. And such a self cannot help but be an illusion. We are not very good at recognizing illusions, least of all the ones we cherish most about ourselves, the ones we are born and raised with and which feed the roots of sin. For most of the people in the world, there is no greater subjective reality than this false self of theirs, which cannot exist. A life devoted to maintaining and expanding this false self, this shadow, is what is called a life of sin. All sin starts from the assumption that my false self, the self that exists only in my egocentric desires, is the fundamental reality of life, around which everything else in the universe is ordered. Thus I use up my life in the desire for pleasures and in the thirst for experiences, for power, honor, knowledge, feeling loved, in order to clothe this false self and construct its nothingness into something objectively real. And I wind experiences around myself and cover myself with pleasures and glory like bandages in order to make myself perceptible to myself and to the world, as if I were an invisible body that could only become visible when something visible covered its surface. To be a saint means to be my true self. And therefore, the problem of sanctity and salvation is in fact the problem of finding out 
who I truly am and of discovering my true self, my essence or core. But there is no substance under the things with which I'm clothed. I'm hollow and my structure of pleasures and ambitions has no foundation. I am objectified in them. But they are all destined by their very contingency to be destroyed. And when they're gone, there will be nothing left of me but my own nakedness and emptiness and hollowness to tell me that I am my own mistake. The secret of my identity is hidden in the love and mercy of God. Ultimately, the only way that I can be myself is to become identified with Him in whom is hidden the reason and fulfillment of my existence. Therefore, there is only one problem on which all my existence, my peace, and my happiness depend. To discover myself in discovering God. If I find Him, I will find myself. And if I find my true self, I will find Him. But although this looks simple, it is in reality immensely difficult. In fact, if I am left to myself, it will be utterly impossible. For although I can know something of God's existence and nature by my own reason, there is no human and rational way in which I can arrive at that contact, that possession of Him, which will be the discovery of who He really is and of who I am in Him. That is something that no man can ever do alone, nor can all the men and all the created things in the universe help him in this work. The only one who can teach me to find God is God himself alone. Guys, I love how Merton articulates. You can't know God or yourself on your own. You can't find God. It's impossible. It only comes by grace, the inbreaking revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Only Christ can reveal what our true humanity looks like. Outside of that, all is futility and lies and man-made fabrication. See, this is the depart from me, I never knew you. Jesus doesn't know our illusory Instagram self. He calls forth the true you in his image. That other identity crisis is not only bound for destruction, but if you have eyes to see it, it did die on the cross with him. It's the you that was already co-crucified. God doesn't endorse lies, not least of those we construct about ourselves. Thus, as St. Paul says, in the final judgment, the wood, hay, and stubble of our lives are burned up so that the gold, silver, and precious gems of the divine image, our true selves, come forth. The goat self is shed, the striving attempt, like Jacob, to work himself into favor by wearing the goat skins of his brother Esau. No, the true Jacob must come forth, shedding the false goat image. Jacob's name must be changed from striving to Israel. God doesn't literally hate Esau. He doesn't hate anyone. He hates what Esau represents, our fabricated false self. Not because he's personally offended at our sin, but rather he hates sin because of its deleterious effects of harming us. Sin destroys and molests his children. And God is foremost father, not Robocop, judge, or even creator. He is foremost father. See, <clears throat> I know it's convenient to divide the world into good guys and bad guys, like a Hollywood movie. But the line between sheep and goat, wheat and tares, runs through the center of every human heart. To quote Alexander Solzhenitsyn beautifully once again, he says, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. Even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. And even in the best of all hearts, there remains an uprooted small corner of evil. Now, this is not to say, again, that we have a dual nature, not ontologically, that we are some sinner-saint hybrid. Y you are light in the Lord. Our only true self 
in Christ is real. But God's judgment is ultimately not against us, but for us. It is ultimately against our delusion, the fabricated, illusory, sinful self, which by our baptism we recognize has died in Christ. Now, sure, our minds are still being renewed, awakened to our true identity, so no wonder we at times do ridiculous things. But that does not mean that sinner is your ontological identity. That false self is the very thing he came to liberate us from, not to punish, but to destroy. All fabrication, all artificiality is bound for destruction, was eradicated on the cross. Identify yourself as a sinner? Well, of course you're going to sin. But identifying with a reality that our old man has indeed died, we begin to live this liberated life of ecstatic, joyous, holy living. To cling on to the sinking ship of sin and death? However, that, that is to learn the hard way. That ship has sunk. Uh, to live by the false self is to live dead already. The facts are the facts, whether we believe it or not. Our old self died with Christ. If one died for all, all died. Faith is not some surcharge, some price tag to create this reality. Faith is merely waking up to this reality. It's not some legal maneuver where some folks become good guys and you know get placed in the saved column. But in reality, they're also just bad guys whose sins God chooses to overlook. No, to, to recap something from the symbolism in the book of Revelation. Okay, Jesus Christ is the book of life. Our old Adamic fallen self isn't written in there. Our true identity in him is written in there. Do you see that this is an existential reality? Simon's name wasn't written in the book of life, but Cephas, Peter, was. Saul's name wasn't, but Paul's was. Abram, not, but Abraham was. Not Sarai, but Sarah. Not Jacob, but Israel. Have you ever noticed all these name changes in Scripture? Now look symbolically at Revelation 2.17. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. We see Jesus is our overcoming. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. He is the word of our testimony. Only our true selves, made in His image, filled with His glory, were predestined for eternal life. It's our new name, our true identity. And this gives proper context to what we've already covered in this series with the wheat versus the tares, the sheep versus the goats, the good fish versus the bad fish. Jesus is separating us from ourselves, and this is not just a future judgment day reality. We face this contradiction daily. This judgment is nothing less than a realization of what happened on judgment day, which was the cross where Jesus says, now has come the judgment of the world. And taking our corruption into himself, the old died, that the true, the new might live, where God was in Christ, reconciling the cosmos to himself, as St. Paul says, and now the old is gone, the new has come. Behold, all things have become new. Now, this is reality, whether you feel like it or not, whether you see it every day or not. This is reality. Now, <clears throat> in this series, we've covered various judgment passages of Christ, all of which were spoken in parables. St. Paul, however, is the writer who is more theologically explanatory. He's unpackaging this stuff for us. And Paul never once mentions eternal conscious torment, which is kind of a big deal for him to skip over if it existed. Now, there are passages in Paul that could indicate annihilation. That is, people not eternally tortured, but just wiped out of existence, destroyed, snuffed out don't raise it all to eternal life. They're just gone, right? Now, well, there are even more passages in Paul, which we've covered, that indicate universal salvation for all. And these latter two sets of texts are quite easily reconciled if we consider the consistent Pauline motive of the destruction 
of the Adamic old man false self and the emergence of the Christic new man, true self. For Paul, the future is not abstract guesswork. Christ and him crucified is the corporate eschatological reality for the human race. As David Hart says, if Paul really believed that the alternative to life in Christ is eternal torment, it seems fairly careless of him to have omitted any mention of the fact. He writes, the texts of the Gospels simply make no obvious claim about a place or state of endless suffering. And again, the complete absence of any such notion in the Pauline corpus, or for that matter, in John's Gospel, or in the other New Testament epistles, or in the earliest Christian doc documents of the post-apostolic church, such as the Didache, or the writings of the uh, apostolic fathers and so forth, makes the very concept nearly as historically suspect as it is morally repellent. Guys, Paul doesn't speak of hell. He speaks of destruction. And perhaps the best example of Paul's eschatological destruction of the old man is 2 Thessalonians 1. When Jesus is revealed in flaming fire and when the reprobate, quote, will suffer the punishment of Ionios destruction from, apo, the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. Verse 9. <clears throat> now in episode 2, titled God is Hell, we explain that this fire is from God. It does not separate us from God. Okay, there's no exclusion in the Greek text. Hell is not separation from God. But Paul's view of destruction, olethros, is not utter annihilation, but akin to 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. You are to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction, olethros, of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Now, obviously, our bodies die, but there's no reason to think this is the literal destruction of the man's body, sarks, by Satan. Rather than the Lord being coercive, he at times allows people to pursue what they think they want, learn the hard way by facing the inherent consequences, only in order to be free from the lie of the sinful nature. Okay, it's like, don't stop the guy if he wants to pursue that which is diabolical. Let him hit rock bottom for his own good. And God, who is playing three-dimensional chess, works within our poor decisions in order to bring our restoration. So in this case, in fact, as Thomas Talbot says, Paul presents Satan himself as an unwitting agent of the redemption. For Gregory of Nyssa, the annihilation of God's enemies is the destruction of sin and death, wherein they are brought into subjection to him and made to be friends. Quote, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, Romans 5.1. Jesus has come to waken us from the identity crisis. Jesus has come to reintroduce man back to himself again. Your true humanity is not some foreign concept. Your original blueprint, your original design, your original DNA comes not from fallen Adam. Even Adam was made in the image of Christ. Jesus Christ is the truest archetype. So living Christ-like should actually be first nature to us, simple as breathing, not an add-on, not a foreign construct that we're trying to fit ourselves into, playing harps on a cloud or whatever we think holiness is. It should be more difficult for you to sin than to be holy because holy is your original default. Maximus the Confessor also explains how our natural human will is designed by God to be in complete synergy and conformity with God's own will. We often think godliness is fasting in a cave, uh, shooting lightning bolts out of our eyeballs or whatever. But walking a dog, having a bourbon with friends, helping a little old lady across the street, grabbing popcorn at the movies, all these things are part of our God-given natural will in conformity 
with a very incarnational existence on planet Earth as human beings. Natural is not ungodly. Human is not ungodly. We serve a human God who slept, ate, and drank. We're designed to synergize effortlessly with God without deliberation over it. But what we're calling the false self, and even touched on this last week, Maximus says this is just a twist. It's a, a perversion of what is good and naturally given by God. And this false desire, this false will, Maximus calls, if you'll remember, the gnomic will. Not like a garden gnome, not like a really short Rod Williams in the, in the yard, okay? But from the word gnome, to, to know the deliberative will, where we waver from what is actually good and true. Like the serpent in the garden asking, did God say? And then living contrary to our authentic existence. That is the false self. The false self is not a thing. It has no inherent power. It is simply our belief in a lie that takes the momentum of our God-given natural will and then throws a judo move on it so that we end up living contrary to what is natural. But it's not this thing we kill off. It's something we wake up from. In both understanding the gospel and contemplatively, relationally, experiencing the real living Christ who is already united to us. Our inner man is renewed, transfigured, awakened back to reality. So our true self is not something foreign, like, like we're these separated from God, totally depraved sinners that have to impossibly try to put Christ on in a way that is strange, like learning calculus or something, unfamiliar, external to us. Put on in Greek, to put on Christ, is in duo. It actually means sink into, sink into Christ like a robe. This is natural for us. This is how we're made. This is the logos of our design. Fallen Adam is what is foreign. Jesus Christ is already our default setting, our authentic design. And the fire of God's love, what we may call his judgment or wrath, it is not against our true selves, but for them. It is against everything in us that stands against love, i.e. our delusion. So taking a dialectic embrace of the scriptural exhortations to actual holiness, the reality of God's correction, together with the passages of his love and the inclusion of the human race, means that we can hold two things not just in tension, but in perfect harmony. We do not divorce the tough language of God's purifying love from the other, clearer passages of God's complete acceptance and our full salvation thanks to the finished work of the cross. Paul always tells us we are holy and we should therefore not act like numbskulls. Sin still hurts people. We're free from it, so let's live like free people. So in this Consuming Fire series, we're showing that the dross, which is burned away in what we call hell, is only the very love of God aimed at bringing forth the gold of our true selves. And I should mention again, I mean, we have a massive 24 session 24 course hour class on the book of Revelation. You guys can register for it, johncrowder.net. Yes, this is a shameless plug, but we just go into much more detail on this stuff than we could fit in this YouTube series. So there you go if you want to go further. But as a reminder, when Jesus touches down in Revelation 19, he doesn't have a sword in his hand. The sword comes from his mouth. He doesn't kill the bad guys. He kills everyone, all flesh. His sword of vengeance is still the word of life coming from his mouth. And this gospel word, because good news is all he speaks, is the very double-edged blade that is living and severs us from everything that is false within us. His death is the death of all. Revelation is pointing us to this cosmic reality of God's judgment against all our fabricated darkness. 
So, of course, Jesus corrects the church. He would be negligent not to. He corrects his churches in Revelation. But that doesn't mean life is just this testing ground to see whether or not we make it. Again, life is education. It's, it's child-rearing. Within our souls at times, we find Smyrna, Sardis, and Laodicea, these conflicted churches. And Jesus addresses these contradictions. Because in metanoia, repentance, we return to the truth of our being, which is the perfect image of his likeness. But we aren't getting Jesus. He's here. Uh, St. Hilary of Poitiers writes along the same lines as Athanasius. He says, We needed that God should become flesh and dwell in us. That is, that by the assumption of the flesh of one, he might dwell within all flesh. So ontologically, that is our objectively true being. We are all perfect, righteous, and holy in Christ. That's the true you. Now, subjectively, in our experience, this life is about the transfiguration of our noose, our minds, our spiritual perception. What's called metanoia, a, a word poorly translated as repentance in English. Okay, So it, this is all about the way of our being matching the truth of our being. So yes, we grow. We're not growing from sinner to saint, but we're awakening to the only real thing he's known us to be the entire time. His bride is shaking out of her deception, a delusion that he himself entered in the incarnation. And now he's gotten inside of us with his Father and the Holy Spirit and is turning the lights on from the inside out. The only real you is the you that is already in perfect union with him, whether we've realized it yet or not. John 14, 20, in that day you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. This is the truth, whether we realize it or not. And when I speak of realizing our true self, you know, what pop culture ironically calls self-discovery is, is quite often a misidentification with the sin-conditioned, mentally ill, false persona that is unknown to God and therefore cannot possibly exist. You know, self-identifying as a polyamorous Brazilian poodle or whatever. Look, cultural ideologies often want us to be loud and proud, identifying with our delusion. But we are so much more than what society or our own base desires tell us that we are. We're not identified or defined by any self-fabricated cultural or even religious identity, but by God Himself, in whose blueprint we are fashioned. Our true self will only ever be an ontological identification with Jesus Christ. Ultimately, the search for self-discovery is vanity, insofar that it is abstracted from the inbreaking revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm hammering on this and placing this within our series on hell because it is the false self that God demands to be destroyed. Not because he's personally offended by us, but because he must remove the cancer that is within his children. And with this perspective, all the fiery prophets and the dramatic judgments of the Old Testament finally begin to make perfect sense in the big picture of God's love and his goodness. And it is the Pauline understanding of the old self, the Sarks, being separated from us. Romans 6, we died and were buried with Christ. Galatians 2.20, I have been co-crucified with Christ. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. Colossians 3, you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, if one died for all, all died. Therefore, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Death to self, sanctification, is not a process. Sanctification, again, is a person. We were baptized into his death. And we can also be hard-headed in our stubborn clinging to that delusion. If a man demands to cling to that delusion... Well, our Father is faithful to refine us. 
We covered so much on this refining back in our Lake of Fire episode, back episode three, but I hardly even touched on how prevalent a concept this was in the Old Testament. You know, the Hebrew word for refining metal is seraph, like the fiery seraphim. It's used as an image of judgment. Uh, the Lord is a refiner. Isaiah 1.25, I will smelt away your dross. Zechariah 13.9, I will refine them as one refined silver and will test them as gold is tested. Malachi 3.3, 3, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi. Psalm 66.10, thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Psalm 12.6, the promises of the Lord are pure silver refined in a furnace on the ground. Psalm 1830, the promise of the Lord is refined. Proverbs 30, verse 5, almost the exact same thing. Isaiah 6, Isaiah saw seraphim in his visionary call, essentially a smelter. The seraph carries a hot coal to purify Isaiah's lips. Uh, Exodus 32, you have Aaron, the high priest. He was a metal worker. Remember, he forged the golden calf. But Christ, our true high priest, refines and shapes us. The sacred objects in the tabernacle, in the temple, were made of gold, the menorah, the mercy seat, the utensils. Everything was covered in gold and bronze. In Revelation 3.18, the Laodiceans are counseled to buy from me gold refined in the fire. This fire is not an abstraction from the finished work of the cross where your old self died. It is an embodying of that reality in its fullness. I mean, what is salvation? Salvation is not some courtroom legal transaction to appease a distant deity in some you know, abstract courtroom where he pretends like you're holy. It's not stamping your paperwork as positionally holy by the blood because you said a prayer, whilst this legalistic God just ignorantly pretends you know, that you meet his demands you know, because he butchered his own innocent kid or whatever, all, all this nonsense. No, look, forgiveness bought is not forgiveness. Love purchased is not purchased. Holiness pretended is not holy. Salvation is the embodiment of the eternal Son of the Father into the heart of our darkness, vicariously curbing our broken humanity back from the verge of non-being. Through his own life of holiness, he reverses the self-destructing disease of our sin by absorbing our own inhuman wrath on the tree, defeating death by death. He did not acquire the Father's love for us. Jesus demonstrates and enacts the Father's unconditional love towards us by meeting and becoming us in the depth of our fallen condition, then recreating us according to His benevolent design. And salvation is the very inferno of the Holy Spirit's fire of love, salting every one of us, burning away the coldness of apathy, turning on the white-hot lights to reveal the delusional false self for what it is, a fantasy. And she does this by illuminating Christ as perfect revelation of our forever gracious Father and perfect archetype of our own true selves. The gospel is all grace. It is all God. And yet the claim it makes upon us means it is there for all of man. We, he will have his people clean, restored to innocence and made whole, not just in theory, but embodied. Now, I hope that after nine sessions, some of this is starting to make sense. People share this, repost it, if you're brave, but people need healing in the real gospel. And um, I hope you guys have been encouraged. We've got one session left, um, and we're going to kick it off talking about evil. Does God create evil? Is there any evil in God whatsoever? Or is God really Trinity? Is He really the Father of the Son, the Son of the Father, and the Spirit of divine love? I'm going to let you guys go. Subscribe to us on YouTube if you haven't already. I'll see you next week, my friends. And uh, before you go, check out this fun stuff that we have coming up before you tune off. God bless. 
For those of you who enjoy the in-person events, I am in the Midwest for one stop this year. We're hosting our Advent celebration again in December with Baxter Kruger and Matt Spinks in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's our big family reunion, so come get your eggnog spiked with the straight grace of an uncompromised gospel. Before that, my only West Coast stop will be a three-day weekend in Redding, California in November. And for those of you on the East Coast, New England, I'll be in Massachusetts for The Wine is Alive in October. I'll also be together with Baxter Kruger in Germany in November, followed by a fun weekend event in Basel, Switzerland, our only two European stops for the year. And finally, plan to join us on the mission field, bringing the party to the poorest of the poor in the Philippines. Register for our Philippines Joy Mission by this October. The trip is in February, but make your plans now. You can find all of these events and more by visiting johncrowder.net slash events. We are made for community, but how do we do that when many of us are the church in exile? What is the church? We need a better ecclesiology, an understanding of the church. Coming up October 26, I'm doing a one-day web event specifically on this very topic. If you have trouble fitting within the four walls of the franchises with their propaganda, politics, and division, you love Jesus and people, but you're just trying to figure this stuff out, you're not alone. This is a one-day online discussion with questions. You can register with just any donation. So visit johncrowder.net slash church, and let's talk. Also, check out our extended e-courses for a deeper dive into various topics such as Intro to Christology, Sacred Mystery, a course on contemplation, Drunk Church History walks through 30 hours of fun, colorful stories to expand your understanding of the past. Plus, there's our radically grace-oriented course on the Book of Revelation. All of these are available only at johncrowder.net slash courses. Check out our monthly live web conference platform, The Inner Sanctum at thenewmystics.tv. It's where I give full-length lectures, interactive discussion, Q&A sessions. Plus, you have hundreds of hours of archive teaching, Bible commentary found nowhere else. And your small membership fee helps support our orphanages and missions around the world. So, it's a win-win. Plunge into the depths of the gospel of grace and sign up for Cana New Wine Seminary. Explore the heart of the Trinity, the ancient faith, the finished work of the cross. It's supernatural and presence-oriented. The online format makes it an extremely affordable theology course, and it's a rare opportunity to drink from some amazing teachers once a week. Catch the early bird discount rate at cana.co.